ABC Church proudly presents The Adventures of Spirit Steve, starring Spirit Steve. His mission, sharing spiritual gifts, life, teaching, healing, encouragement, giving, and many more. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of Spirit Steve as he shares God's power given to God's people for God's purposes. <laughs> well, good morning. That is Spirit Steve. If you haven't met Spirit Steve, uh, Stephen Chavez is our middle school coordinator. Uh, if you've got middle school students, yes, you can be afraid. Um, <laughs> Spirit Steve is there to save the day. We're so excited about this new series. Um, we are going to, for the next six weeks, talk about superpowers. So we're talking about the fact that every single believer, does this sound really loud? Feels like it's about ready to blow someone's face off. Sorry, Podge. Um, we're talking about how every single believer has superpowers. And you might not think, well, I, you know, I'm not faster than a speeding bullet, uh, you know, or more powerful than a locomotive. I can't leap tall buildings. You know, but you have, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have superpowers, I promise. You have the gift that God has given you in superpowers. You know what uh, superpower I always wanted? I think, parents, you could relate to this. Um, we have a minivan. Uh, there, I said it. So... <laughs> That's not a superpower, by the way. That's not quite the same thing. But we, we end up, uh, you know, whoever's in the passenger seat of our van um, in the front there, you know, usually whether it's me or my wife, it's typically my wife, um, usually ends up spending more time on her knees facing backward than sitting down with the seat buckled. Can you relate to that, you guys? Yeah, if you have kids? Yeah, we end up facing backwards. And in a minivan, it's a long way back now. We got our big kids sitting in the very back. So we end up throwing stuff, you know, to them. And so we, like yesterday, we were driving out to Morro Bay. We made some sandwiches, and we try to throw a sandwich back to the kids. It was in a little Ziploc, but, you know, we try to throw it back, and it lands in the baby's face and smacks them with a sandwich. You know, great parenting. We're awesome parents. But I want the superpower of go-go gadget arms. Who wants that, right? Maybe it's not a superpower, but, man, if I could just go-go gadget arms, here's your sandwich. Boom. Didn't hit anybody in the face. In a minivan. It's amazing. That's what I want. So I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, cute. These superpowers. You probably figured it out. It's spiritual gifts, right? If you read ahead, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're headed into about six weeks of spiritual gifts. And we're saying as a church during this season, spiritual gifts are God's superpowers. It's God's powers given to God's people for God's purposes by the work of his spirit. Now, you know, you might have figured that out and you thought, oh, that's cute. I get it. The plan words they use Spirit Steve and whatever. And okay, let's get on with the, the context. But I don't want you to miss this one point. This is really helpful. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus tells his disciples some final words before he leaves and goes back into heaven. Listen to what he says. In verse 49, he says, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city, don't leave, until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, it's, again, it's easy to miss that. Okay, so Jesus is saying, don't go, don't go do the work or the mission that I've given you until you're clothed with this power from on high, but don't forget who's saying these words. This is a guy who, like 30 days before this, actually was killed and was dead, and they put him in a cave, and they rolled a giant boulder in front of it, and he raised himself by the power of the Father, raised himself back to life, removed that massive stone, and then he started doing crazy things like walking through walls and like making food come out of nowhere. This is the guy that says, okay, stay here, you guys, because this same power, the power of heaven that raised me from the grave is about to descend on you, and you, believer, you, Christian, are going to be clothed in the power from heaven. It really is superpowers. Don't diminish that fact. These are supernatural powers given from on high, otherworldly powers, things that don't happen naturally, things you don't earn, things you don't try to work on, things that you can't learn over a, a period of time with experience. These are heavenly supernatural powers descendant on God's people for God's purposes. Amen? 
And we can't miss that this morning as we look at this text. Turn with me um, as we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start right at the beginning of the chapter here. Here's what Paul says. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Other translations say ignorant. He doesn't want us to miss it, just like I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed about the power from on high that's coming through the Holy Spirit and is going to be used in your life. Don't miss it, Paul says. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one, is, no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Paul's drawing a very clear distinction here. He's saying in this world of superpowers, there's heroes and there's villains. And just like every great hero story, there are evil forces of darkness at work. Paul's saying, I don't want you to miss that because in fact, you were led astray. He said, I'm not gonna talk about how or when or why you were led astray, but the fact remains you were led astray. You are tempted by these spiritual forces of darkness. There's power that exists there, and he's really concerned that we don't discredit the dark power with the light power. I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be led astray. Then he goes on to give us a really quick, simple, yet critical test for distinguishing dark power and light power. He says right here in verse 3, Therefore, I want you to understand no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. How do you know if it's a spiritually dark power or spiritually light power? Do they claim that Jesus is Lord? It's a very critical test, especially when you have someone knock on your door, and you open the door, and you tell them that you're a Christian, and they say, wow, I'm a Christian too. Let me explain all of the reasons that my faith is the same as yours and that we praise and worship the same God. There's a very critical test that must be performed in that moment. And Paul says, do they say Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of God? John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see, there's some of these cultic religions will mess with the language just a bit and add one single letter, and the letter is A. The Word was a God, and they'll say, well, Jesus isn't God. Jesus isn't pre-existent. He wasn't existent from the beginning of time. He was a descendant maybe of the Father. But when we deal with some of these false religions, the false, dark, spiritual forces at work in our lives, we've got to ask one simple question. Do they say Jesus is Lord? This test is critical. Not only that, but the point is there's power in Jesus' name. When someone says Jesus is Lord, that's done only by the work of of the Holy Spirit. Today, there's a more popular idea that there's many ways to get to this God, and who's to say that their God or the God that they serve is different than the God that I serve, or the way they're getting to God is different than the way I'm getting to God, and we have this pluralistic path kind of generated. You know, it's the, 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 the tolerant viewpoint that we see today, and then a lot of times people would say things like, well, Gandhi, you know, is a great leader, or Muhammad, you know, is certainly a, a man of conviction you know, a man of faith, and who's to say that the God he serves isn't the same God of the Bible? Well, it's a very simple test. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but through me. And so Paul's saying, do they say Jesus is Lord? Because nobody says Jesus is Lord but through the work of the Holy Spirit. And you'll find that these other paths, quote-unquote, to God will not bestow the power of Jesus' name as God incarnate, God himself, the way that the Bible does. It's a really important distinction. There are not many paths to God, not many sources of spiritual power, but one. The second point there is that there's one source of power in this world of superpowers. Read the second half of this verse with me, or this passage. In verse 4, it says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, There are varieties of activities, but the same God. You guys picking up the theme here? Who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, ability to distinguish between Spirits. 
to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Did you pick, pick up on that? This passage is far less about the gifts, far less about the superpowers, and far more about the giver, the source of power. He says again and again, eight times to be exact. Verse four, same spirit. Verse five, same Lord. Verse six, same God, given through the same spirit in verse eight, and it goes on and on and on. It's the same source of power. It's not you who has the power. It's not different individuals who have their own power. It's the power of God in and through them, and it's critical that we understand the power comes from God, and the power is used by God. The Holy Spirit gives the gifts, and the Holy Spirit exercises the gifts. Spiritual gifts are God's powers, not your powers or mine, or any other power for that matter, given to God's people for God's purposes by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 7 with me again. He says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. Who has superpowers? Who has spiritual gifts? Every believer, everyone, you and I, all of us who believe in Jesus have spiritual gifts, superpowers. Well, what are they, and how do I know what they are? We're not going to focus a lot of our attention today on the different spiritual gifts, although it says there are a variety of spiritual gifts. And then we see in verse 8 on, there's a list of nine specific spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives and exercises through believers. Now, there's a, a couple of resources we'd like to just point you to. In fact, over the summer, uh, Lauren took our ladies through First and Second Corinthians, um, kind of a flyover of both books in the summer. And uh, the ladies used this tool, um, a spiritual gifts test, um, to kind of just walk through the um, assessment of what spiritual gifts may I have showing up in my life. And it's, it's about 15 to 20 minutes if you're interested in doing that. It's on our website, so you can go to the sermon notes page, and there's a link there. You can click that. It's a little online test that you can take if you're interested. Some helpful tools, a lot of resources there um, to, to really drill down on what spiritual gifts are being used in my life. One of the most important tests in my mind, is the affirmation of others. If someone is able to point to God using you in a specific area of ministry um, that's producing fruit, then oftentimes that's a good indication that, that that's a spiritual gift for you. But I love the, the simplicity of, of what John Piper says here, because I think we can get a little overly complicated on some of that. As with anything in the church, we can just start to pick you know, little tests and really start to nitpick over how, well, how much percentage do I have of teaching or how much percent, you know, you can kind of start to do these tests and try to rate all this stuff. And in all honesty, I think it's distracting at times. And what John Piper says in his sermon on this passage is he says, the way I like to think of it is this, is here's someone whose faith is in jeopardy and I ask, how can I help them? Then I do or say what seems to be most helpful and if the person is helped, then you may have discovered one of your spiritual gifts. It's really simple. If there's someone in your life that needs some encouragement in their faith, someone that you could help continue to move along in their relationship with God, and you do or say something that ends up being helpful to them, that might be a spiritual gift. We don't have to split hairs over titles. Well, is that prophecy or is that teaching? Is that wisdom or is that knowledge? No, if you do something or you say something that's helpful to someone in their faith, there's a good chance that that's a spiritual gift. In other words, that that's God's spiritual power in you being used rather than your own human nature, your own experience or expertise speaking into a situation. Superpowers are for the good of others. And look at in verse seven again with me as we finish that one verse. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Why do we have spiritual gifts? Why do we have superpowers? It's for the good of others, not for my good. Not so that people could not, not notice or acknowledge me. Yeah, I think we get this superpower envy sometimes. You know, we look around and go, man, I wish I could speak like that guy, or I wish I was as merciful or as patient as that person. I wish that I had the knowledge or the depth of insight or the wisdom of these people, and we kind of compare our spiritual gifts. Well, really, that makes it about us, doesn't it? Me, I wish I could. I wish I was more like that person. We're making it about us instead of making it about others. On the flip side, I think we, we often wish that people would notice what we're capable of. 
you know, if they only knew how good of a singer I was, you know, I could be a really good worship leader. You know, if they only knew I was good at teaching, someone could pick me to do that role. Put me in, coach. You know, it's like we're waiting for someone to notice us. In reality, that becomes more about us as well. We're about the platform as opposed to the actual gift being used and leveraged. When I worked on staff at Biola, I um, oversaw this group of worship teams that went out to uh, camps and conferences and um, churches and whatnot, kind of in the name of the university. And so it was kind of a coveted position for some of these students. You know, they wanted to be a Biola band. And so we'd have these students often call, you know, or come talk to us and say, I want to be a Biola band. How do I get to be a Biola band? You know, I want to go lead worship in chapel, and I want to go to these camps and whatnot. Well, there was a really interesting, quick test that I learned not long into my um, journey there that uh, was a very simple, basic question, and I would just start to ask them, where are you leading worship right now? And it's amazing when you ask these students that have these great aspirations of being a, quote, worship ministry team, worship band, and all these amazing venues and whatnot, that they're not leading worship. You know, I said, well, what about your dorm room, your Bible study in your dorm? Or what about the youth group that you're a part of? Or what about your small group at home? Or what about your family? You're not leading worship. You're not encouraging others to engage with God. You're not leading them in prayer or times of singing. You're not doing that well no i'm just waiting for the opportunity see it's about the platform not the gift and i think we do that so often it's sort of like i'm waiting for the platform i'm waiting for the opportunity i'll wait until i get asked yeah i'm probably super good with kids like i could probably really nail that second grade class but i'm just gonna wait till they ask you know because that's about you. It's not about me, and it's not about, you know, what God wants for the church. It's not about the unity of the church. It becomes about you. It's not what spiritual gifts are for. God has superpowers for his people, for his purposes, for the good of others. There's one source of power. Look at verse 11 with me again quickly. All these empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Don't miss those last three words. How does God give good gifts to his children? As he wills. As you will? No. As you hope for? Maybe. But God gives as he wills. He's going to give it. He's going to use it. He's going to work through you as he wills. And this is so important for the sake of unity in the church. Because when I make it about me, then it it becomes territorial. No, this is my piece of the pie. This is my ministry, and someone else is stepping on my toes now. No, God's giving as he wills because he wants to use you in his season, not in your season. He wants to use you with his family, not with who you choose to be your family. God is giving and acting and working. These superpowers come from God himself. There's one source of power. I know I have that point on your outline two times, but it's for a reason. One source of power, when we start doing things on our own strength, we mess it up. Who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Not your strength, but God's strength. One source of power comes from God. And I love what Paul doesn't say here. This this text doesn't say that God gives his superpowers, his spiritual gifts to believers one time. It's not as if just one time I get this indwelling of the Holy Spirit and this power. No, he continues to move and to act and to work. And there's a chance you may get a different set of spiritual gifts for a different season in your life that God's going to use. You know, I I feel that way oftentimes with, with teaching. And it's so easy, I think, when anyone stands on a stage to sort of get a big head about it and go, oh, I'm going to talk, you know, and everybody's going to look at me, you know, and look at what I can do and look at how good I can communicate a truth. And that just makes it about me. And the reality is God gave the gift. I didn't, I didn't earn it. I didn't pay for it. I didn't trade it in from something else. It's God's gift. And so I pray every Sunday that I have an opportunity to share with you that God would exercise his gift in me. It's the spirit who exercises. It's not me. And so if you ever catch any hint of Jeff Ricky going, well, that was a pretty good sermon, then you can squash that as fast as you feel necessary. <laughs> Just say, nope, Jeff, it was not you. It was the Holy Spirit's gift in you. I'm reminded of this little orphan girl, really attractive little girl. Um, there's a story of her in the Old Testament. 
who grew up, her parents died at a young age, and she was raised by her uncle. And she lived in a foreign land as an outsider, in a relatively oppressive land. And the king of this land um, was pretty brash, and he ended up ostracizing the, the queen, sending her out and saying, you can't be the queen anymore, and basically kicked her out of the palace. And then he called this beauty pageant to bring all these young girls in, and he wanted to choose for himself a new queen. And so this young little girl, her name was Hadassah, we know her as Esther, is brought into the presence of the court of the king, and he chooses her. That's the girl that I want to have as my queen. So she becomes known as Queen Esther. And this little girl finds favor with the king. And as she grows, she grows in wisdom. She grows in knowledge. And God bestows on her God descends the power from heaven, just like Paul says in chapter 12, verse 1, that, that God would give every believer gifts as he sees fit, apportioned to his will. And he gives those powers to Esther. And in the right moment, when the time was right, he gives her discernment, he gives her hospitality, and he gives her wisdom to use the exact right words that this king, now remember, this is an oppressive environment, and, and also women don't have a seat at the table in this culture. So the women, in fact, had to eat in a different area. They lived in a different palace. There wasn't an opportunity for her to sit across the table from the king and share her thoughts on the political regime of the kingdom. But God brings her into his presence and she has heavenly wisdom, I think, that transcended any human understanding and no one could know but God himself what words that king needed to hear in order for him to make a decision to free the people from the oppression of the kingdom and for him to be able to say that Israel is honored and regarded in my kingdom. And that woman did exactly what she needed to do at the right time and her uncle Mordecai said, for such a time as this, Esther, God has brought you and equipped you. And it might be that way for you. You might feel like, well, I haven't been used the way that I want to be used. I haven't got the gifts that I want to have. I haven't been equipped the way that I, I hope God will equip me. Well, for such a time as this, you have no idea what he's preparing you for and what gifts he might bestow on you for such a time as this. God gives as he sees fit, apportioned according to his will, from verse 11. But honestly, there's some of you this morning, as you come into the room and, and walk through whatever circumstances you've been through in your week and dealt with whatever uh, problems you've had to deal with, you walk in and you, and you say, this is a great message, Jeff. I understand, you know, the passage is really helpful, seeing spiritual gifts, that it's God who gives them, it's one source of power, all those things. But you know what, to be honest, I feel as, about as regular and ordinary as they come. I don't feel like a superhero this morning. And I want to just remind you that that's a lie. It's not the truth, because the truth of God's word says that every believer, and just as Jesus prayed, for his disciples in John chapter 17, and then just as he commanded them in John, or Luke 24 to stay in the city because the power from heaven's gonna fall on you and you're gonna be equipped with the heavenly power, this morning we have to believe that that's true of us. And it's really hard to do in our culture. It's really hard to do in the, the, the rhythm of trying to keep up, is it not? You know, about a week and a half ago, I hit a wall, and you know, as many of you have at times, just in, in your routine and schedule, and things just weren't going really well at home. I was impatient, and I've felt exhausted, and I think a particular morning, I burned the breakfast, you know, and so it's like smoke is coming out of the oven, and then I opened the pantry, and we found like an infestation of ants, and so we're like, you know, gutting the pantry, trying to get rid of all these ants, and I, one of our babies spit up on the last pair of clean pants I had, you know, right before. It was just one of those days, and I did not handle it well. I'm just being honest. I did not respond well, and I was tired, and I was worn out, and frustrated, and discouraged, and I began to tell myself things like, I can't do this. I don't have it together. I don't have enough strength. I don't have the capability to continue 
I'm not enough. I'm not being the father that I need to be. I'm not being the husband that I need to be. I'm not being who I need to be for my job here at the church. And I began to tell all myself these lies and, and, and begin to believe these lies and hold on to them and to the point where it just about disabled me. And my wife, in her amazing discernment and wisdom, she looks at me and she says, Jeff, you're hearing lies. You're believing lies. That's not true. And she said, I want you to go after work, when you're done with work, I want you to go somewhere, go for a bike ride or a run or go to the ocean. I don't care what you do or where you go, but you need to go somewhere where you can hear from God and don't come home until you hear truth because you're believing lies. Such a good woman. (laughs) And so I did. I left work that day and I drove all the way down to Montana de Oro and I, I I jumped on the Bluffs Trail and I ran for a couple of miles until I got far enough out where there wasn't anybody else around and I found a little ledge kind of tucked down on the side of the cliff there and I found a place to sit and I sat there for a couple hours and just let the fog kind of blow in from the coast and the wind and, and see these powerful waves crashing below at these rocks and the tide began to, to raise and I was probably about 20 feet up off the level of the water but the tide came up and these waves just started getting bigger and bigger and these sets are coming in and it got to the point where the water was splashing me just from sitting up where I was sitting and I just stopped and I just asked God, Lord, would you please speak to me? And I intentionally set down everything else, my journaling thing and the verses I'm reading and the thoughts that I'm going through my mind and the prayers I'm praying and all the things that I do in those moments and I, I just stopped and I just said, God, I'm gonna stop. I just wanna hear from you. I wanna hear you speak. And I waited. The tide's coming up and getting more wet. It's kind of getting cold. The sun's kind of gone by then. I'm like, okay, God, I'm waiting. I waited for a long time, probably an hour and a half. God's not speaking. And I waited and I waited and I waited until I finally, as I'm watching these waves smash these rocks and splash and really build this amazing coastline that we have because of the power of the ocean, I hear God say really clearly, don't question my power. And I start to kind of explain it away. Well, God, you know, I'm so so tired. I don't have enough energy. I don't have the patience and I'm not doing well with the kids. I'm not reacting and responding well. And I hear him interrupt me again. Don't question my power. But you don't understand. It's not that that I, I don't believe in your power. It's that I can't do it. I can't embrace your power. And God says again, don't question my power and it's as if as I sat on the edge of that cliff God was smacking me in the face and saying Jeff Erke is not enough. Jeff Erke cannot keep it together. Jeff Erke is not well enough equipped. Jeff Erke will never be the parent and the husband that he needs to be apart from me so don't question my power. Stop doing it in your own strength. Embrace my power. Stop making it about yourself. I don't know how many times I've said that in a sermon. It's not about you. You probably count a bunch of them. I have to say it to myself almost every day. Well, a couple times a day. It's not about Jeff Erke. And yet I, I do it again and again and again. And God was almost screaming at me, Jeff, don't question my power when Jesus said, stay here. Don't leave. Don't leave the city. Don't try to do these things that I've set for you to do. Don't try to go about your work and your ministry and your life apart from my power. Don't go anywhere until this power from heaven, the same power that conquered the grave, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that's going to ultimately redeem the world back to himself. Until you've got that power, don't do anything. So I stopped. And I finally listened. And it dawned on me as I'm reading through this passage, this is it. (laughs) It's as God apportions according to his will. All these empowered by one and the same spirit. Not empowered by a decade of experience. Not empowered by education. Not empowered by parents. Not empowered by work not empowered by physical strength, not empowered by rest, not empowered by relationships, not empowered by strength in your marriage, not empowered by your own flesh, but empowered by one spirit, the same God, the same spirit that works and acts and moves. The same God that brought you to him is the same God that's gonna work in you and work out your salvation. 
one day. Don't question my power. The band's going to come join me out on the stage. You know, the best thing about superpowers is you didn't do anything to get them. You can't trade them in. You can't sell them. You can't buy them. The best thing about superpowers is they're given. And this passage this morning is all about the giver, is it not? It's about the God who gives good gifts to his kids that he loves. And I promise you, God has given every single one of you, if you embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he has given you spiritual powers, superpowers, to accomplish the work that he has for you to do. It's God's powers for God's people, for God's purposes, and God's gonna do it if you let him. Don't question his power. Don't believe and embrace these lies that you can't do it. You can't. Apart from him, it's impossible. But don't question God's power and what he has for you. I want you to stand with me, would you? Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus not long after, and in chapter 3, verse 14, he says this prayer because he knows that, that we're human and that our ability to start to believe the lies that we're fed by the enemy is so easy. And so he prays this prayer and he says, I don't want you to forget the power that you have access to. I, don't you, I want you to forget the work that God has called you to. And so this morning, as you stand with me in this room and we're all just in the same boat, we're all weak, we all get frustrated quickly, we all get overwhelmed. We all have the tendency to not use the gifts because of the platform that we don't have access to or because of the relationships that we didn't think that we had. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, God using our gifts, we hold back. And so Paul writes this prayer for us, I believe, so that we can believe it, we can hold fast to it, and we can leave this room with our heads held high knowing that God has given us spiritual superpowers Powers that are completely outside of our context. Powers that are otherworldly so that we can do what he's called us to do. So close your eyes for a minute and listen to this prayer from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's the power we have access to. Let's not forget it this morning. And as we sing, sing with your head held high. You, my friend, you believer, you Christian, have been clothed in the power from on high. And God wants to use us. Let's do it as we sing. Come on, let's declare these truths about him together. Come on, he's a God of power. We can trust in him. Coming on the cloud. Here we go. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord? Oh, come on, sing it out. And our God is the lion. The Lion of Judah is power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. His blood 
breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before him Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings, Jesus. God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop? Come on, sing it in His power. Here we go. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power in our battles and every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. you, Lord. Lord, we trust in His power. So you can stop. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Come on, He's unstoppable. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Tell me who can stop the Lord. Come on, lift your voice together. The heart God is the lion. The Lion of Judah, He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before it. And such a good reminder. Yeah, we can clap for that for sure. Superpowers are God's power given to God's people for God's purposes. We're going to look at this for the next six weeks as we dive through spiritual gifts and just process through what gifts God is giving for what purposes and how is he using them in you and me. It's really, really important for us. So join us uh, as we continue on. In the notes here on the back of the outline, uh, we've created a reading plan that will take you all the way through the rest of 1 Corinthians. So we're going to start at the very beginning with the reading plan. In fact, there's a little bit of history and context uh, in the verses this week. And then if you were to read through that for the next 12 weeks, you'll finish 1 Corinthians at the same time as we're finishing the series. So take advantage of that. We'll try to print it um, each week, but we also have it online if you go to the website. Um, today's a really exciting day. Jeff mentioned it, but it's Back to Church Sunday. We want everybody to get back in the rhythm and the routine of church. So there's a lot going on out there in the courtyard. Um, if you've been thinking, you know, it'd be good for me to go ahead and take a step of getting connected at ABC. Um, go ahead and stop by the Connect booth. We've got women's ministries out there um, and I think student ministries to find out information about what programs are going on with even CR and um, some of those other things happening. So pop on by one of those. I think there's barbecue sandwiches out there as well. If you want that, have a great Sunday. Thanks for coming. <laughs>